What's up, big guy, Salvatore? How are you doing, my friend? <laughs> doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing great, man. Um, this is uh, this is something that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Um, admittedly, I hold you in high regard, and uh, I, I I can't wait to get started. As you can see, I'm working. I don't know if you can see. I had a R6 Mark II with a 50 here. I've got the R6 Mark II with a 15 to 35. My Sennheiser. I, I got all sorts of nice setup. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, fellow cannon shooter here. So, Sal, again, uh, let's start things off. Um, it, it means the world to me that you would, uh, you know, take a little bit Thank of you. time uh, from your busy schedule, I'm sure, uh, with Alyssa and all that jazz that you got going on. Um, so um, on behalf of, you know, the entire um, photography community, uh, this is focused uh, a, a set of interviews that I'm putting together essentially as part of a request from my YouTube channel. I asked him if I if I would be a great idea to you know, showcase some of the best photographers in the world, some of which are obviously my favorite. Um, and it was a resounding yes. And so uh, you were awesome. one of the few names that, uh, you know, came to mind because of the fact that, again, I hold your uh, your craft in high regard and things of that nature. So um, you, brother. Uh, community, man, we're, we're so pumped that you're here. Um, this is going to be a, a nice, short, quick uh, half hour interview. Hopefully we uh, adhere to um, uh, the, uh, the time frame, but we tend to talk a lot behind the camera. So um, having said that, um, I want to start the things off with a couple of rapid fire questions. These are, you know, quick, witty, kind of get the blood flowing and, uh, you know, get okay. little, uh, know you a little bit better on a, on a more personal side. Right. Because, um, you know, we know what you do uh, behind the camera. So we want to know who uh, Sal Sincata really is. You ready for me? I'm ready. All right, buddy. Here we go. Um, what do you love the most about golf? Uh, you know, that's a great question. What I love most about golf is the how impossible it is to master. I think a lot of the things we do in life, there's you find a formula, you find a rhythm, you get comfortable. And I found that golf is one of those things where on Monday, you might play the best round of golf in your life. And on Tuesday, you are the suckiest golfer on the planet. And I think I think that's what keeps me coming back is that pursuit of excellence, if you will. Okay. That's a, that's actually a great answer. I like the way you, uh, you phrase that. What is your random question? What's your favorite focal length right now? Uh, favorite focal length right now has been 85 millimeter. And I think that's uh, bundled with the um, depth of field as well. So I'm shooting a lot, 85 millimeter one, two. Uh, and I just love, 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 love the way it looks on skin, the way it looks on portraits. And so I'm having a love affair with that lens right now. There you go. Well, actually, fun fact: I I traded banter back and forth with your YouTube on your YouTube channel because I was on the fence about selling my EF eighty five, and you were telling me, "Hey, get the get the RF version, go full native." I, admittedly, I sold the eighty five EF. I I got the uh, the fifty one two, which you were using with Alyssa on your most recent video, which I love, by the way. Um, and um, I've I've grown accustomed to the 50 man it's like growing on me i was an 85 guy much like yourself but you know sometimes i i'm I'm a, I'm a destination wedding photographer here in puerto rico and sometimes 85 is a little too tight for the places that i go to yeah and so it's great I, for that yeah and so having that one two like i've never had a lens that you know that fast one two is blowing my mind right now so i'm gonna say 50 for now but it's probably until i get my hands on your 85 so We'll, we'll see about well, it. Well, no, 50 is a good one, too. I think th it's the depth of field, you know, like so many photographers are like, oh, because it is expensive. It's, there's no lie there. But if you shoot 85 or 50 and you shoot with the like 1.8 version, you're like, oh, it's fast enough. Does it is it that big of a difference? Holy shit. It is a huge difference moving from that 1.8 to 1.2. And everybody hates on it, right? Like if you're if you don't have the 1.2, you hate everybody who does. You're like, ah, it's a waste of money. But man, once you get that one too, it's it's gold. I'm, I'm totally there with you. I have I'm 100%. Um, my next trip will definitely be to. Oh, me. Oh, sorry. Uh, my next trip will. I thought you were about to tell me where you're going. I'm like, it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, no, my next trip will definitely be to Europe. Uh, I'm going over to uh, Italy. I've got a workshop that I'm doing. We're calling it Destinations Unknown. Uh, we had to let everybody know where we're going. But originally, you were just paying for the workshop. and You didn't know where you were going. We were taking care of all the airfare, hotel. Uh, but some of our people, they, they couldn't deal with not knowing. But we're doing uh, New York. Uh, we're doing uh, Paris, London, 
um, in uh, ending up in Rome, Italy. So that's just going to be this incredible like whirlwind uh, two week workshop that I'm taking people on. But I can never get to Italy enough. That's obviously my favorite place in the world. Yes, yes, Italia. Um, so hands. yeah, so go ahead and um, I'll, I'll plug in the information right now. Where to, where do we uh, sign up for this? Shameless plug. Oh, I wish I was plugging it. It's sold out, so I can't. Oh, I really? can't even okay. take. Okay, well, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> if I right. wanted to come, I couldn't take. All right, let's jump ship for a second. The one thing I love the most about Alyssa is her um, her wherewithal. I'd have to say she is a. Um, she is an equal in every way, shape or form. And and I know a lot of people feel like their partner is equal, but I don't know. I don't think it's true. Like she runs step for step with me. I can trust her with absolutely anything. And uh, I mean, you saw you were working with her uh, in many cases. I think she's the real boss. I'm just I'm just here for the ride. OK, so Alyssa apparently wears her pants. OK, sounds good. Um, Sal, level with me. What do you what do you enjoy the most about photography? Um, it's probably the, you know, I would say early on, I would, in my career, I would have said the creation process is the, the most favorite part. And I think that's probably why everybody gets involved in photography, but I've been doing this 15 going on 16 years now. And I think today, what I love most, the creation, I think is a, a given. What I love most today though, is the collaboration, the collaborative nature of the work I've been doing lately. Like it's been really fun growing my YouTube channel. Arguably we were late to it. Uh, I had way too many other things going on to be a quote unquote content creator. Um, but we're having a great time with it now. And now I'm finding myself collaborating more with like stylists, hair, makeup, people, models in general. And that's translating to my actual clients because we still run an active studio but I'm finding that I'm working with everybody in a much more collaborative way and it's leading to some incredible results. Okay. Yeah. I'm definitely uh, seeing the uh, content being pumped out on your YouTube channel, which I'm thoroughly enjoy. I will go ahead and link that below so that people can subscribe. Thank you. Um, what is your best childhood memory? Best childhood memory. Um, <laughs> this is just the first thing that came to mind and it's not the best I would say, but it's the first thing that came to mind as a kid, I was super competitive. I've actually never told this story before as a kid. I was super competitive, uh, played baseball, football, um, tennis. I mean, you name it. I, I wanted to compete. I've always been a competitor and I think now I've taken it into the world of business, but I was about, uh, I think it was nine years old. And I played the worst baseball game of my, of my life, but I was nine years old, right? So it's all relative. And um, we're leaving the field and um, I go to reach for the handle of the car and my parents drive away. They left me there, but they didn't realize they left me there for at least 10 plus minutes because apparently I was in the back just being quiet. They thought I was in the back being quiet you know, like, it's not that bad. You know, you'll play better next time. They're trying to console me. And then I guess 10 minutes later, and this is in New York, 10 minutes later, they realized, they look back and they realized we don't have him in the car. Uh, and they had to, to circle back and get me. But, you know, I, here I am nine years old, just standing on the street, uh, licking my wounds, so to speak, and just waiting for my parents to come. You know, there was no cell phones back then. And, um, you know, it, it was just a different time. But yeah. that's when you ask me that question, like I said, it's not my best <laughs> memory, but it's the first thing that it's the came most. To mind. Memorable, yeah. These things uh, take, uh, you know, a, a place in your in your mind, in your heart. I get it. Thank you for sharing that. Me. Uh, I'm sure that it's not the first time that's ever happened to a parent. Um, I'll you know, I'm not I don't have kids, but I'm sure it's happened before. Um, so, Sal, you and I are both Canon shooters. I think we have been for a while now. Um, is there a dream camera? out of Canon that like us outside of the can that you've been, you know, always like eyeing and you've just never been able to get your hands on either because it's like uber expensive or just like an antique or something like that. Honestly, I've been a Canon shooter my entire career. I don't really know any other platform. When mirrorless first came out, I tried to work with uh, Sony. This is going back maybe four or five shit, maybe even six years ago. It was before Canon really got on the mirrorless platform. And I remember trying to, I, I bought this Sony 
And I had it for a week and I could not figure out the menuing system. I don't care what you say. If you're a Sony shooter, don't, don't fucking hate on me because I'm a Canon shooter. But you know what I'm saying to be true because that menuing system on Sony is complete shit. Like nothing makes sense. The vernacular they use doesn't make any sense. Um, so and so I, I had it for like four days, five days and sold it to somebody. And I sold it for $500 less. I'm like, just take this thing uh, and get it out of here. I, I never moved to it. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, a, like a bigger camera, I actually have a phase one uh, IQ3. I can't remember how many megapixels that is. It might be 200 or 250, but that is an amazing uh, camera. And, you know, in a day and age where it's all about megapixels and, and uh, you know, more, more, more pixels, it's like the sensor hasn't changed. So camera manufacturers are doing all these kind of funky things to get more resolution. But when you try a true medium format camera, the sensor's like this big. And so the pixels are arguably bigger and the quality is better. Uh, and so that's a that's a beautiful camera for like landscape work and things like that, but an expensive one nonetheless. Okay. And admittedly, I've never heard of uh, of that body. I'll have to look that out one. Um, what's, yeah, Phase 1 IQ3. Phase 1 IQ3, okay. Uh, what's one movie you can watch over and over again? Whew, that would be The Matrix. I have watched The Matrix, the original one, uh, uh, so many times on repeat. It's just one of my favorite movies. Okay, what about it um, sort of draws your attention? It was, uh, well, I, I just love the story. And I, you know, uh, and, and now, now, especially with like what we're seeing in AI, and you start thinking about like, what will the future hold for us? Oh. Uh, and it's just one of those things where the fight scenes were so like, and, and still to this day, I think those fight scenes were still revolutionary uh, in what we were seeing. And I grew up, you know, Star Wars, and uh, the special effects there were groundbreaking. And then I remember seeing Matrix. And one of the Star Wars was actually out at the time. I forget which one. And I watched the Matrix and I was like, holy shit, this is next level. Uh, and I've, I've enjoyed that movie ever since. Okay, very cool. Um, do you happen to have some artwork hanging at home of your own? Well, it's funny you should say that. We, uh, we are the, I actually just made a post uh, this week, and I'm the uh, the shoemaker's kids have no shoes, right? So our house literally has nothing on the walls. Uh, the walls are completely empty. And my wife and I sat down just yesterday, and I posted a picture to my Facebook page of some of our travel. And the one I posted was from China. Uh, I was at the Great Wall of China, China and we were doing some work up there uh, for Pro Photo at the time. And uh, I got this incredible landscape shot uh, on the wall. And so we went through it's sitting right here. This hard drive is right here. This is all my travel photos okay. uh, that we that we took, and I put on one hard drive, and we're finally going through it room by room in the house, and we're putting pictures up on the wall. Very cool. Yeah, um, I actually started printing some of my own, especially when it comes to trips, not photography. Uh, when it comes to portraiture, but um, you know, I, I've been to New York a couple of times. I just got back, actually, I've been to San Francisco. So the Golden Gate Bridge is hanging. You know, Grand Central Station is hanging. So I'm gonna make it a point to to, to hang up some some artwork from places that I that I've been to, just to like a friendly reminder that there's more than just the USA out there. So um, so yeah, very cool. Um, and finally, uh, this is gonna be a fun one. Uh, I'm sure Alyssa is gonna love the answer to this one. What is the key to a successful marriage? Wow. What is the key to a successful marriage? I would say um, listen uh, to each other. And I think, you know, Alyssa and I, you know, Alyssa started working for me uh, before we ever dated. And she was my studio manager. And, um, you know, we got to know each other working for each other. And I think a lot of husband wife teams they don't meet working for each other. We met that way. So we have, we had that relationship where we were, we had the ability and still do to compartmentalize work and compartmentalize personal. And I think that's the key is if you're always listening to each other, um, ego gets taken out of the way. I think, you know, if I, if I do something or I snap at her or something, she'll tell me and I'll apologize. Right. It's never this like, well, you did, 
it never works that way, man. Now you're just deflecting. And so I think one of the things that have helped us is to, you know, we're friends first and foremost, uh, but we definitely listen to each other. Uh, and I think that's helped us, you know, work, continue to work together. I wholeheartedly agree. I think that finger pointing gets uh, people nowhere fast. And uh, you said it yourself, man, deflecting. And sometimes it's just about shutting your mouth and uh, opening your ears and uh, keeping the ball rolling. So I love that answer. Um, well, it's business relationships too, right? Like the one thing, it's it's the same in business. You know, you see a lot of photographers where they'll have like a customer service issue just blow up on them and somebody's leaving like a one-star review or just somebody negative. Look, I find most times when there's a negative review, the client didn't just wake up and go out there and leave a negative review. They've tried calling you, emailing you, resolving the issue. Again, there's usually there's a one-off, but 80% of the time, I find that if you're listening to your clients and they're raising the red flag and you are working towards resolving their issue because you're listening to them, even if you're not wrong, just shut your fucking mouth and try and make it right. And I have found over the years that when I do that, my, my bad reviews are minimal uh, from clients because it never gets to that point. It never escalates there. Well said. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, thank you for sharing those. Uh, so uh, let's get down to the nitty gritty. These are the uh, the mind bending questions, hopefully. And uh, the first one will be, um, so Sal, we all have that epiphany, right? That moment that we realize uh, what it is that we should be doing with our lives. Tell us about your aha moment in photography and what prompted you to follow this journey. Wow. So I started photography when I was about um, 16, 17 years old. Photographed my first wedding at 17. My aunt had a dark room in the basement. My girlfriend at the time, her dad uh, owned a catering uh, facility. So he was handing her weddings uh, to photograph. She was a, a photography major. She was a freshman in uh, college. And I got the bug. I mean, that's where I got the bug. And it's funny because I hated weddings. So we're going back into like the early, you know, mid 1980s, right? Something like that, uh, 86, 87. So I'm 17 years old. Wedding photography just sucks. Um, you know, it's very, very posed, very traditional. Uh, we're dealing with film. So like you've got, you know, not like today where you can shoot with your white balance on auto. Like that shit just didn't exist back then. And that's not a badge of honor. It's just, it's why I hated it. But uh, and being an immigrant family, my family, I was I'm the first to graduate college. So they're like, no, you're not going to be an artist. You're you're going to college. You're going to be a lawyer. Uh, and that ended up being the path I was going down. All the while, though, I'm doing photography on the side. I'm, I'm so passionate about landscape photography, architecture. Uh, I love it. And in fact, you see the architecture inspiration in all my work. Uh, because that's what I fell in love with. And then one day I figured out, well, shit, I can actually take this picture of a bride, put her in this giant frame, bride and groom, and now they'll pay money for it. Uh, and so I was in corporate America. I was working for Microsoft uh, for 10 plus years. And uh, one day I was just like, I, I, I don't I don't love this. I don't want to make money for somebody else. Uh, I want to do what I love, even if I make less money. Uh, hindsight, that hasn't been the case. Uh, but, you know, at the time, I quit my job, I quit everything I knew uh, to chase this crazy dream of being a professional photographer. There you go. And uh, Bob's your uncle, as they say. Yeah. So I, I have a I have a similar um, story. I'll make mine short. Um, so I was working for Homeland Security almost six years, um, specifically when it comes to uh, FEMA, like disaster management. And I was I was rolling with the punches, like literally I was you know, fielding calls from people who lost their homes, had their car flooded, um, my, you know, lost people to COVID and stuff like that. And I said, you know what, I, I can't take this anymore. And so as soon as, uh, you know, flooding in Kentucky happened, I put in my two weeks and said, you know what, I do not like myself when I'm in front of your computers. I like myself when I'm behind a camera. And so right. that's how I got my start um, into full-time wedding uh, photography only only back in like August. So I've been doing photography six plus years, but it, something about wedding photography actually, you know, pressed my buttons. And that's when I started following you around and that's a joy around and all these, you know, uh, awesome. big timers. So that's, that's how I got my start. Um, so again, going back to your YouTube channel, uh, Sal, 
Um, it's safe to say that you're a fan of flash photography. What is it about it that blows your mind? And what's the best tip that you have for somebody looking into a flash? Um, you know, I feel like flash is a very versatile tool. It's light, you know, and, you know, look, I'm sitting in here and I've got natural light coming in through my window. And don't get me wrong, natural light's easy, but it's not malleable, if if that makes sense. Now, yeah, we can use scrims and reflectors, and but overall, it's not malleable. You're kind of dealing with what's there, right? Because show, tell me how you're going to work with natural light at nine o'clock at night. Well, you're fucking not, right? Um, and that's why I like flash is because it gives me the ability to do whatever I want, whenever I want. Now, that being said, you have to, you know, acclimate to the situation. What does the situation call for? Uh, what kind of room are we in? And again, it's just like golf, right? It's a puzzle for me. And so I love when I'm creating and I want to add, I want to add some color, right? I want to, I just recently did a video of uh, one light uh, using Kelvin to cool off your shadows. And so that's a cool thing to figure out where you can set your Kelvin balance on your camera to 3,200, 2,800. Well, all the natural light is going to turn blue, you know, so your viewers watching, try it, grab your camera, turn Kelvin to 2,800. If you even know where Kelvin is, right. You got to learn how to use your, your gear and take a picture. Everything's going to be blue. Then you're using a gelled strobe to create warm skin tones. That process I'm obsessed with, right? Because you're always tinkering. You're always creating. It's like being a chef. I also love cooking. And so these things all have the same common thread. There's artistry in all of it. And that's what I love. And if you, if you're not into flash photography or you're overwhelmed by it, you know, my advice would be to that person, just get started. Yeah. Get a flash. And I used to do, uh, I, when I was teaching people and teaching myself, that's where this comes from. I would gra grab a can of like Coke or Pepsi uh, and I would put it on a, on my kitchen counter and I would start experimenting with like the direction of light. I would experiment with, right. How high, how low, how, you know, you're not going to get Rembrandt or any of that stuff. There's no nose, but I'm learning how to balance my flash with ambient light, different color temperature. So that's where you want to practice. I, th I find a lot of photographers and sorry for the long winded answers uh, go out there. They try flash once, right? They'll put it up. They'll take a shot. Their screen is overexposed. Everything's white or everything's black. And they're just like, fuck. And then they put the flash back in the bag because they're panicking. You got to, you got to give it some time. You got to work with it. You got to build confidence with it, just like anything else. And then eventually for those of us who do use a lot of flash in our work, it'll become a muscle memory and, and you won't panic the next time you have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Admittedly, um, I'm not necessarily a newbie, but sometimes like when when I have to deal with a wedding planner and I don't have a lot of time for bride and groom photos, sometimes it'll give me like 15 minutes just to just to do something, anything literally. And so I have to have my assistants just like, hey, go sit up. I'll be there in a second, yada, yada, yada. And sometimes even to this day, I still fumble around my settings because I want to underexpose the background so that I can, you know, nicely, you know, get that uh, bright and groom, nice and like, beautiful. So sometimes still to this day, I'm like, oh crap, crank, crank, yeah. lower this. It's, it's, it's a mess. But, you know, once you get it, you definitely get it. And you are the master. Seriously, you are the master about that. Um, so Sal, what emotions overcame you when you found out Canon made you an explorer of light? Tell us about that moment and what it means to you. Yeah, the the Explorer of Light program from Canon is basically their Hall of Fame, in my opinion. Um, and I'd been working my entire career as a Canon shooter. And I think, you know, I wasn't working towards becoming an Explorer of Light, but man, it was in the back of my head all the time. I'm like, what's my legacy going to be? What am I going to leave, um, you know, to this industry, to the next crop of photographers? And that's that's kind of a little bit of a segue that's why I do, I'm do. i doing YouTube. That's why I did things like Creative Live. That's why I have a conference called Shutterfest um, because I love our craft and I want to leave my mark on this industry and so that 10 years from now, we're still doing something, even if it's not me, but that we're still carrying the torch for the next generation of photographers. But, you know, when I got the call, oddly enough, the way, the way I found out was face-to-face -face with Canon. Uh, I'd been doing some work 
you know, teaching some like in their, their uh, labs in California. Uh, I've done a few uh, photo walks for them. And uh, I get an email, which led to a phone call, but they said, hey, you know, when, when are you going to be in New York again? I'm like, oh, I said, I'm coming back from, uh, I believe I was coming back from overseas, honestly. I said, um, and uh, I think we're going to be in New York for a couple of days. Like, great. We'd love to have you come out to, you know, home base, uh, which is out in Long Island. And I'm like, yeah, okay, no problem. Really didn't think anything of it. Uh, and I think in the back of my head, I was like, could this be it? But I didn't want to get my hopes up. I didn't want to, you know, get overly excited. And uh, sure enough, we went there face to face, had a meeting with three of their uh, senior people. And it ended with them telling me they want to make me uh, and Vanessa. Vanessa and I are in the same class uh, for becoming Explorers of Light. And I, I was just I was just over the moon, man. Like it, it felt like I finally made it. Yeah. So it just you, you feel like you, it justified every single piece of artwork, every every work that you put together um, to get that call, man. It's like, uh, you know, going to Kenton. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and and being enshrined. Good for you, man. I, I, I love that about your story. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so shifting gears here, what were some Salas and Kata forms of employment before you even held the camera in your hand? Like, I know, oh, I know wow. you, you just told me you were in Microsoft for 10 years. What else did you, did you uh, stumble upon? Yeah. So in college, I was, uh, I really found, they found that I had a knack for uh, programming. It was the craziest thing in the world. So I graduated with my business degree, uh, but I had a minor in IT and I was taking graduate level programming courses as an undergrad. Um, it, I, it was just too easy for me. So my instructors were moving me along. But like this is mid 90s, right? So the internet has just really started to gain, I guess you can call it traction, right? It was still dial up. Uh, but I, I just had a knack for it. And I ended up graduating uh, college. I, was getting, I wanted to go to law school. So I was also pre-law finance. I mean, I was I was really, really working hard at, at school. Um, I don't know. At that age, you don't really know what you're going to do. You think you know what you're going to do. And um, my my counselor encouraged me to start going on job interviews. And I did. I, I interviewed with like AT&T, a couple other big name companies. And it turned out that I, at the time, I was one of very few people who had both a business degree and an IT degree. It just wasn't a skill set back then, right? So, and if you really go back to that time, most chief information officers were not IT people. They were finance people. They were marketing people. Uh, they weren't letting the nerds run the world at that point, right? It just wasn't going to happen. So me having that finance uh, business degree and having a knowledge of IT, I was a hot commodity coming out of college. So my first job out of college was working for Procter & Gamble uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, as a native New Yorker, a New Yorker's mindset is like, there's New York, there's Florida, there's Chicago, there's California, everything, you know, there's Vegas, uh, and everything else is flyover country. So that's just kind of our mindset. So when I went to move to Cincinnati, everybody, all my friends were like, what, what you're going to Cincinnati? Like, what's there, you know? And uh, of course, it's a beautiful city. And um, so I worked for Procter & Gamble for about two years and I'm getting job offers doubling my salary. Uh, and this is like late nineties. So I leave Procter & Gamble after two years. Now at the time, this is a company that people would spend 20 years at. Um, I leave and I start doing independent uh, consulting. I'm in my, I'm in my early thirties and I'm making 250 to 300 grand a year as an independent contractor. And I just learned early on that I could go off and do this stuff. Well, I get a call from a headhunter and they're like, Hey, would you be interested in going to work for Microsoft? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And all right, give me your resume. Well, my resume was garbage, but I sent my resume. Sent my resume anyway. Uh, she calls me back. She's like, Microsoft's not interested in interviewing you. You have to fix your resume. And I'm like, I'll get to it. You got to remember at this time, I'm in, again, I'm in my mid thirties, early thirties. I'm making bank. And I, I'm like, I don't need to, I don't need to go work at Microsoft. They fixed my resume for me. I get the interview. The interview at Microsoft 
was uh, almost 10 hours of interviewing. Uh, started eight in the morning. We didn't leave till eight at night. Um, and I had like time for a break, break between interviews, but it was grueling. Uh, I end up getting the job, work there on and off uh, for years, all doing photography on the side. And that's that's my corporate pedigree there. So not not bad Two major fortune uh, companies in Procter & Gamble and Microsoft. But that's, you know, if you think about photography, whether you think I'm a good photographer or not, one thing I think is undeniable is what we've been able to accomplish in an industry where we have a million dollar studio that was growing during the middle of the 2008 recession. We did that because of business acumen, not necessarily because of photography acumen. Got it. Yeah, um, that's actually, um, you're getting slightly ahead of me of perhaps uh, the answer to a, a possible question that I will be asking you about okay. business and how they're both inevitably intertwined. But thank you for, for sharing that with me. I I, I actually was uh, an account executive with Toshiba back then. So I, I too was uh, in the, uh, you know, suit and tie corporate world for a while. Um, didn't last long. I just didn't catch, catch the vibe. Uh, it just wasn't me, honestly. Yeah. And much like you, I, I enjoy not reporting to anybody, not being micromanaged. And that's also a reason why I left, uh, you know, corporate America to pursue our, um, you know, uh, consonant dream. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so you touched base on this. You're a, you're an IT guy. Artificial intelligence is all the rage right now. I ran across a video of yours fumbling around with some art. Uh, actually, I should say um, earlier this week, uh, I asked Taylor Jackson, who was with me uh, a couple of days ago, uh, where he stood on AI. Um, you recently made a video on it. And my question specifically to you, Sal, is how much artificial intelligence do you foresee implementing into your particular workflow? Well, we're using AI not for imagery. We're using it for all the other tools. I think the tools out there like ChatGPT, um, you know, you can integrate that into like Google now for Gmail and you can have automated responses going out. Now, you have to be careful how you're using it. That We could save that for an, a future discussion. But we are absolutely uh, embracing AI for social media uh, content creation, script writing, script ideas. Um, it, it's undeniable. It's not going away. So I think anyone who wants to sit there and put their he head in the sand and say, it's not going to be a thing. I'm not embracing it. I'm never going to do it. Ah. Those to me are the same people who are like, digital photography is a fad. Okay. Uh, we see how that worked out. So I think it's the same thing. I think if you're going to be a business person, you have to adapt to changing market conditions. Again, that doesn't matter if you're a photographer or you're a baker. You have to adapt to trends that are happening. Um, now, how much you bend, that's up to you. But to ignore them, uh, I think is just foolish. Okay. Um I was um, I was expecting a, a, an answer along the lines of like culling and photo editing, but but I, I can I can see just how strong your business side of of photography is, and this is great because you know this is the the goal ultimately when when putting together these interviews so that I can pick various brains and he and see how we all you know interact and and um, you know engage with our 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 craft yeah well no it's funny you say that i mean of course there's ai tools out there like um oh man i'm just drawing a blank like evoto ai and i mean there's a host of tools coming to market but it's really that part of ai in our business editing is not all that new i mean photoshop has been in lightroom have been embracing some level of ai um and not even them like skylum they're, they're all been using some level of AI in their tools. Now it's just thrust upon us uh, in a much more robust way. To me, that's a given. We're going to use tools like that. But the culling tools, they're not that good. Like I, I've, I've seen a lot of photographers talk about like how they're using culling. Um, and uh, I'm like, I call bullshit on it. You know, I used to own a... Uh, post-production company. I actually just sold it. It's called Evolve Edits. Uh, I don't, I no longer own it. Um, uh, I sold it to one of the managers and um, we, we looked at AI calling tools and 
Evolve processes over a million images a month for their over 500 clients. So you think you've got more images than we do to train this AI system? No fucking way. Like, so when we're pumping through a million images a month in color correction and selection, you're not going to beat that. And what, where I'm going with all this is we did everything in our power to train the AI and it still couldn't figure it out. It's still making bad decisions because as a photographer, now will it get better in the future? I don't know. I just know right now I wouldn't trust my business to those culling tools uh, in and of themselves. Why? One of the things we found with those culling tools, expression. So you know as well as I do, when you're photographing a client, they give you that cheesy ass smile and then they give you a real smile. And part of our job as, as photographers and artists is to get them to feel and look natural. Fucking AI doesn't know what that is. They don't know that that image with the bride's eyes closed was something you were going for all along those lines, right? Well, what that forces you to do is to run it through AI and then double check all the work. Well, fuck, have you really saved any time at that point? I would say probably not. Uh, and that's where we came out with. Now, in the future, I don't know how that, I can only imagine it'll get better as a tool. Okay. Um, that's a that's a pretty strong stance, I'll say. But uh, hey, you speak with conviction and, and I'm all for that, man. Um, I, I personally use Aftershoot. I think it it has trimmed down my my post editing workflow uh, for quite some time now. I've been using it for a couple of months, and when it comes to you know wedding photography, at least I know it's not your jam, but you know that's essentially ninety five percent of my business. And coming home to to three thousand plus pictures and then to trim the fat to like maybe half of that fifteen hundred, I'm I'm happy, man. Um, so it's not making any mistakes for you. It's it's what now? Not making any mistakes for you. Um, well, I mean, admittedly, it's not a hundred percent perfect. I mean, it's it, there are some you know caveats here and there, and uh, like you said, I do end up making sure that I'm I'm mostly concerned about the the amount of pictures that I will be using and thus editing and eventually delivering, most of all, as opposed right. to what it actually called and and stuff like that. But we can we can spend all day talking about that. Um, <laughs> let's let's shift gears here. Um, so I um let's have some fun with this one. I, I recently ran across a video of yours fumbling around with some artifacts. Like I think it was a pantyhose and like pasta strainer uh, in <laughs> get, like <laughs> creative with some portraits. So what does that say about us as creators and what advice would you give to someone who's feeling a creator's block? Yeah. It's funny because one of the things, so I'll give the quick answer on that. One of the things I'll tell you to do as a creator, uh, I figured this out about, three to four years into my career, um, I was getting bored of doing the same thing over and over and over again. I was, I was just creatively burned out. And uh, it was actually Alyssa and myself came up with the idea of let's take one week every year and go on a content creation. Now, this is before YouTube was content creators paradise. And we weren't doing it for YouTube. We were doing it for us. And so we would take one week a year and we would plan a trip uh, and we were going to, we'd go to, we called it the land store. So we did uh, Ireland, Scotland, uh, England, right? So we did something like that. Uh, and every year we did a trip. Now, if you're just getting started, you don't have to go on an international trip, but if you live in, uh, you know, Nebraska, take a, take a weekend trip, head out, head, head out to uh, Chicago, head to Texas, head to California, Find some place that's this four or five hour drive, six hour drive, and do photo shoots in that city. And so we started doing this every year. My portfolio has blossomed since I started doing that. Uh, I it gets me out of burnout mode. I think differently. I experiment with lighting because who cares? This photo shoots for me. So if every picture sucks or the model has to stand there for an hour watching me fumble with my camera, it doesn't matter. Uh, because this is all about me, not paid clients. And that would be the most important thing you can do as a creator is just take, and maybe one week's too ambitious, right? But maybe you take two days a year and you just focus on you and things you're struggling with. Now, the video you're talking about, uh, we did, we thought it'd be fun to try all these 
YouTube hacks, uh, mm-hmm. right? Reels, you see them on Instagram reels, yeah. all these stupid fucking hacks that you see people doing. And I'm like, let's see if we can make them, let's see if we can actually create some good looking images using these hacks. Some of them worked. I was blown away with how well they worked. And then some of them, I even say it in the video, I'm like, this is shit. You know, it's it's complete garbage. No, I, I enjoyed myself. It, it's uh, admittedly, it's not a, a video I um, I saw coming from you. But <laughs> it, it's fun. You know, it's fun to sometimes venture outside of our realm and, and you know, do something that can borderline make us uncomfortable just for the sake of growing. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the heck out of that video, um, especially your reactions at the end, of course. Yeah, a video, you know, videos like that, that's one thing to know. We are not very, um, if you haven't figured it out already, we are not very scripted. You know, the the person you see uh, online, the person you meet face to face, I'm the same person. There's no like on air personality. Um, And thankfully, our audience and people love that. They find us to be somewhat genuine. You know, I know I got a foul potty mouth, but hey, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, We're going to drop a couple of adjectives in there. But I think I would much rather us be true. And I'm giving this to this advice as just not, you don't have to be a content creator, just as a business owner, be you, whoever you are, be you. Because I find that if I'm trying to be one person to you and one way to like YouTube and another way to somebody who's face to face with me and another way to my family, that's way too much work. I, I I can't, I can barely keep track of where I'm going to be tomorrow, let alone who I'm supposed to be. And so I think have fun uh, as a photographer, be silly with your clients, you know, get them to laugh, get them to remember you uh, for all the right reasons. And uh, we got the best jobs in the world, man. Get out there and create some art. Yeah. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. You're, uh, you're about as genuine as it gets, um, at least on you know, on social media and things of that nature. So I appreciate better or for worse. Yes, sir. (laughs) It doesn't matter. It's who Um, I am. Yes, sir. Um, So you touch base on this uh, in your answer. Um, So we live in a, in a digital world and with that comes the need to create short form content, right? What's your stance on YouTube shorts and like reels and TikToks? And do you see more value in them on a short form factor than long form content? Yeah. uh, It depends is the answer. Um, so we have many clients that we're trying to serve, right? Uh, all of us as photographers, you don't, don't the mistake photographers make that I talk to is they think, well, I'm not a content creator. That's, you know, that's something you're doing, Sal, but I'm not, well, that's not necessarily true. If you step back for a second and think, think of what we're doing as photographers, whether you're a wedding photographer, boudoir, uh, portraits, You're creating content. Now, maybe that's not in the traditional sense as we would define it, meaning for YouTube or TikTok. But here's what you have to remember if you're a photographer today. It's just like the photographers you'd run into years ago and they'd be like, I'm not getting on that Facebook. Okay, well, great. Go back to MySpace, Boomer, and you can stay there. But for everyone else, we're making this transition. And we have to understand that our customers are on TikTok. They are on Snapchat. They are on Instagram. They're on Facebook, right? Our customers are absorbing short form content in one way or another. So if you're a wedding photographer, I think it's naive to believe that your next crop of brides is not on TikTok, is not on uh, Reels. It's silly to believe that because that's just not true. Okay, so you have a choice to make. Are you going to start pushing on that platform? Now, here's where I think things we would probably, we could do a whole other, you know, interview on this. What I'm not going to do, me, is go on to YouTube, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, any of them, and start doing trending videos, right? Where I'm doing stupid shit, making, you know, like this one where people just point to shit and they film themselves, but there's nothing there. And then they, I don't, that's not me. I don't want to do that. I think it's stupid. I don't think my clients want to see that. I think my clients want to see, and I'm talking to the average photographer here, they want to see what it's like to work with you. They want to see what a high school senior shoot might look like. Are you having fun? Are you being silly? They want to see what a wedding looks like. They want to see, you know, some things I think every photographer can embrace is a behind the scenes photo, right? Of me taking a picture 
but I got like a dumpster here on my left hand side. There's like traffic in the background and all of a sudden, right? So what it looks like or what it, how it started and then the final image and what, you know, what it finally looks like. Like even as a photographer, if you just do something like that, you're a content creator and that's, what's going to attract the brides, the boudoir, the seniors uh, of the future. So I think everybody has to embrace being a content creator. You just have to figure out who you are and who you want to be online. What's your online presence going to look like? And so I think everybody has to do it. I don't even know if I answered your question. No, I think you did, actually. Um, I was just about to say that that answer is sort of like a representation of a, an online business card. Like you, you yes. from your from what you just said and your YouTube channel, it sounds like you 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 have a perpetual and consistent business card presentation so that people can like in your own words know what it's like to work with you and know what it would eventually be the outcome and the result of your hard work if you were to join forces so i absolutely you answered my question yeah and i i want to drive this point home like okay you know maybe i do i did a video with um uh, you know how to create beauty portraits with like continuous light hey, something like that it's a month or so ago i did that I had clients come in three weeks later, high school senior clients come in. And the first thing they said was, we saw that video you did a couple of weeks ago. We, we want to do something like that. Okay. So there's my point. My current client base, even though I'm producing content, training content for other photographers, my current actual paying clients are seeing that content and it's working full circle because from their perspective, they're going, Hey, he's still relevant hey, that's a cool thing he just did. I want him to do that of me. And then I'm servicing professional photographers as well. That's why I think everybody at a certain level is and should be a content creator. You're right. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you said. We're on the same page. Um, I, I do have that business background that we share. So I am completely simpatico with you. Um, now, that was a perfect segue to my next question. As a portrait photographer and a great one, I might add, um, what's the key to getting the best shot out of people? Does it even have anything to do with photography itself, do you think? That's a good question. The I always find that when I'm working with people, the first 15 minutes is throwaway uh, for portrait photography because the average person gets in front of the camera, they feel awkward. Um, you know, it's not something everybody does is get in front of the camera every day. So most clients don't feel comfortable. So usually if it's a high school senior, because we photograph them in multiple outfits. The first outfit to me is always throwaway. Um, obviously on a wedding day, there is no throwaway. Uh, you know, so the first few minutes with somebody I'm shooting, but it's, it's just getting them a little bit comfortable. And the trick for me is to, and this is not easy for everybody because if you're a photojournalist, you know, you tend to just want to go into the corner somewhere, right? And just hang out. That, that is not the way I work at all, as you could imagine. Uh, I'm in the room and I'm goofing around with people. Uh, and I, we find, me and Alyssa both, that as soon as my camera comes up, everybody starts acting differently. This is where having a second shooter who knows how you work is priceless to getting those images. You can't get a photojournal. I'm not a photojournalistic photographer, but if you go through some of my portfolio, you'll see work that looks photojournalistic. And that's just the rhythm that me and Alyssa have from working together. She knows that when we arrive in the, the bride's you know, ready room, I'm going to start goofing around with the bridesmaids. I'm going to start cracking jokes. Uh, I'm going to start you know, picking on some of them and they'll start picking on me and all the girls will start laughing. Alyssa's shooting that the whole time. She's documenting it. And now when we get post-wedding, we've got all these like candid looking photos and they're like, I didn't even know you took those. Exactly. Because we're just being human. We're not being photographers. The camera is just a tool. Uh, and if you hide behind that camera, it's very difficult for people to engage with you over that tool, right? So I think the best piece of advice I can give you is even if you're quirky, be quirky, have fun with your client, the pictures will come. They're secondary. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I love a cook candid over posing any day of the week. Don't get me wrong. You and I can probably pose people from here to kingdom come, but I think it's 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 the authenticity of the moment. And if you can, I, I always say there's a difference between giving a prompt and posing. Like prompts yes. or trying to look for a reaction as opposed to 
posing actually and just like stay still for me hold one two right. shoot which by the way i've acquired from you i go one two just like you <laughs> you, you are literally an influencer so um let's uh let's have some fun with this one really quick um i think you touched base on it from the rapid fire but what in your professional uh, opinion is the absolute best lens for portraiture and what do you tell a phot photographer looking to invest in decent glass well, I'll take the latter part of that question first. If you're getting started as a portrait photographer, it's expensive. You already know this, right? From camera bodies to camera, uh, you know, camera lenses. It seems like there's a never ending amount of shit you can spend money on. But I learned this early on. I'd rather buy something once uh, than buy the cheap version and then go and end up where I know I'm going to end up anyway, which is the more expensive version. So the piece of advice I would give to any photographer, any platform is to invest in good glass. Over time, the camera bodies are gonna have more and more megapixels. You can upgrade the, the body, but there's no reason for you to upgrade the glass. And prior to switching to mirrorless, um, some of my Canon EF lenses, which are part of their DSLR platform, um, I'd had for seven to 10 years. I hadn't. I, there was no need to upgrade them. Uh, and that's what you have to understand. So save your money and invest in good glass. You'll get sharper images. It'll last longer. Your work will look better. Um, and then over time, you can add to it. So that's the piece of advice I'd give you. Invest in the glass. That's the most important piece. Um, my favorite lens for portraits uh, is the 85 millimeter. There is just, it, it, there's the way it makes a face look because if you start going wider than 85 millimeters, uh, 70 might be okay. But if you go wider, features start skewing, right? Nose looks big, face gets bigger. It just has a different look uh, to it. And so that 85 millimeter is just good compression, crisp. Uh, and it, it's just, it's an all around incredible lens. Okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, you, you had me at uh, 85. I, I guess I have to put it on the, uh, on the wish. I'll put it on the list, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, you know what, Vanessa uh, just uh, uploaded her, uh, her new 135, which I'm also on the fence about. Oh, that's I, beautiful lens. I think, I think it's, it's more useful for weddings an 85 than a 135. Although I can give a 135 to my second shooter and have them snipe away. We can do that all, all day probably, but yeah, I, I agree with the uh, the 85. So Sal, let's uh, start winding down a little bit here, but I want to plug this in because I enjoyed it. I, I think I watched every single episode. Um, it wasn't too long ago that you had a sort of like a reality show on your YouTube. Yeah, the creator program. series. Yeah, creator series. How did that idea come about and what was the motivating factor to put together something like that? It's back to the story I told you early on. I am hyper competitive uh at whatever we're doing like i i don't i'm not saying i always win but my mindset is i want to compete i want to challenge myself i want to be better and uh there was nothing really like it in our industry a few uh, maybe seven eight years ago adorama did something similar but it, it it didn't feel right the way they ran it it felt very very hokey very uh cheesy I, i'm not going to bash them it was a long time ago but that kind of inspired us, right? And so we saw that and I'm like, okay, how do we put our spin on a, com a competition uh, of sorts and how do we challenge photographers and get them uncomfortable? Because I think that's the key to understand is that it's easy to do things when everything's going according to plan, but can you rise to the challenge uh, and step up when all shit is going sideways on you. Oh, and the sideways in, in many of those segments was, one, you've got me standing right over your shoulder. I mean, those guys performed. You know, you're only seeing snippets of it, but I was there with them. The clock is ticking. Um, you know, I'm standing over their shoulder. Of course, they're struggling with lights and things like that. I mean, that's just natural. Uh, and I loved every minute of it. We're trying to get off season two. Uh, this year, we're working on trying to get some sponsors for it uh, because it, it's not it's not inexpensive. Let's put it that way. Right. But I loved it. And it seemed like everybody who watched it really enjoyed it. Um, watched, you know, because you sit back and you're like, well, I would have done this. I would have done that. Hey, in 10 minutes, who knows what you would have done. Right. And I think that's kind of the point. And I think that's why so many photographers enjoyed it because those videos are getting like two, three hundred thousand views. 
So, and we, we, we're in a niche industry. It's not like photography is this huge industry. Uh, and so it was really good to see and be part of. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed myself. I love the, the challenges within the, uh, the actual episodes and uh, it, they were tough, man. You, you were bringing out the best in these people and uh, I'm, I'm happy it all worked out for you. It was innovative and I think it should be, you know, mainstream and good luck to, uh, to season two. Um, so really quickly, Sal, um, your name carries a little bit of weight, but I'm sure that you've got your own photographers that you look up to. Who are they and why? It's funny. Um, I don't look up to any photographers. I stopped paying attention to what other photographers were doing probably 10 plus years ago, not in a I'm better than them way. I, I just found it to be distracting. Instead, where I look to for inspiration and motivation is um, Hollywood. That's really where I, I spend a lot of my time looking for inspiration, whether it's the way a director has lit the scene, uh, has shot the scene, angles they choose. It's not uncommon to see me and Alyssa watching a movie. If you were hearing us, I'd be like, that's an incredible scene. Like, because I'm just looking at how the director of photography is just setting things up. So there's really no one in particular that I look to. It's just mostly I'm a fan of Hollywood uh, and great cinematography. I, I just... I just love it. And that's what we try to use for most of our inspiration. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine what it would be like to be a fly on the wall while you're watching The Matrix or, <laughs> or, or with Alyssa, you know, chowing down on popcorn. That's awesome. Um, so, OK, so let's uh, let's leave the best for last. Sal, what do you tell a kid who is looking to go into photography full time? What words of inspiration would you share with a guy or a girl wanting to enjoy their craft to make a living just like you and I? Uh, I would say ignore the haters that will be there. Um, photography is an interesting craft. I think it's like every other one. But as you start doing better and better, uh, the noise starts getting louder and louder around you. You can't do it that way. That's not how we do it. Um, and I think you see a lot of this in our industry is uh, like local groups uh, I have found over the years are the worst critics uh, because they feel like, well, if I can't do it, why should you be able to do it? And I think if you want to be successful in photography, you have to learn to drown out that noise uh, and really focus on building your business and building customers. Because at the end of the day, I got news for you. You know, I'm based out of uh, St. Louis, the St. Louis metro area. And those people chirp so much. Uh, and, you know, don't get me wrong, we've got photographers that we've helped over the years and they love us uh, and they support us. And then we've got all those kind of people chirping in the background. At the end of the day, those people chirping are meaningless, right? Not to me, but to you, no matter what market you're in, they're meaningless. Are they putting money in your pocket? Are they customers? Are they hiring you? So what they say, what they think is irrelevant. And a lot of photographers, because they're artists uh, and they don't have confidence yet, they could be distracted by that noise. And I think you got to learn to ignore that and just charge forward, make your clients happy, do what you love doing. And ultimately, if you're doing what you love and you're making your clients happy, I promise you, you will be successful. There you go. I, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Great answer, Sal. Um, so that's going to be it for us, man. Um, I Thanks have for having me, man. Wanted... This was fun wholeheartedly appreciate your time. And uh, I, I laughed way too much, way harder than I, I thought I would. Um, it was a, an absolute pleasure having you. I have uh, I have looked up to you uh, in, in many ways in terms Thank of you, brother. how you how you handle yourself and, and, and what content you put out. And, and generally, you know, your, your time on in front and in behind a camera with Alyssa is always fun to watch as well. So shout out to Alyssa Sincata for allowing us to, uh, to finally get together. So before I let you go, man, uh, tell us where we could find you, YouTube, Instagram, all that good stuff. And if you want to plug anything in before you let you go, uh, feel free, man. Floor is yours. Yeah. First thing I'd like to say is our hands-on photography conference. There's nothing else like it out there. It's shutterfest.com. Uh, it's in April in St. Louis. You will have the time of your life and build your portfolio at the same time. We've got like over 250, 300 models from around the country uh, that are part of it. Uh, to follow me online, my Instagram is Sal Sincata and YouTube is Sal Sincata one I don't know where the uh, original Sal Sincata is, but we got to take him out mafia style. Uh, but follow me online, guys. 
All righty. Well, I appreciate you uh, wholeheartedly, Sal. Uh, so that's going to be it for me, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to my interview with the great Sal Sincata. If you want to watch more of these, go ahead and make sure to hit that like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want uh, me to reach out to any other photographers from around the world, feel free to drop it in the comments, and I will highly consider it for my next video. So on behalf of Sal Sincata, my name is Francis, destination wedding photographer in Puerto Rico. I will see you guys in the next video. Shh.